Aloha. Welcome to the Condo Insider Show today, the show that talks about condo living. And today I'm your host, Cheryl Franklin, and we will be talking about the seven deadly sins of a condo board of directors. And I'm honored because uh, with us today, we have an industry expert who has um, been on the scene in this industry for quite a, quite a long time. That's Richard Emery, and uh, Richard is normally a regular on the show. We haven't seen you for a while, Richard. What have you been up to? Well, I think when you introduce that, I think you're trying to tell everybody I'm old because I've been <laughs> around so long, but that's okay. And as you know, I've been a co-host on the show, and, uh, and we brought you in a few months ago because we're planning for the future. And between Jane Sugarmer and I, it's, uh, it's a lot to do to prepare one of these shows. We've done about 160 plus shows trying to wow. educate uh, condo boards and owners alike as, as well as any association. But what I've been up to is that uh, for some reason I got busy in my part-time work and was retained to be an expert witness in several association type litigation matters and uh, began teaching uh, continuing education courses for real estate agents on condo management, which I was asked to do to help educate real estate licensees. So. I got really busy, but we wanted to give you a chance to kind of work your way into this. So I guess I'd say, uh, or Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, <laughs> I'm back. You know, you well, know. well, thank you for that. And that certainly sounds extremely busy. And that's one of the things that makes you an expert. You're in demand. So let's just jump right in and uh, let's start with what are some of the common mistakes or sins, if you will. Well, I should give credit to... Uh, Originally, uh, The Seven Deadly Sins was uh, a seminar given by a local condo attorney named Richard Ekimoto. Mm -hmm. And it gave me the uh, uh, thought about what he had to say, which was very insightful. But because of my expert witness work, I had a different take on what The Seven Deadly Sins were, although there's some kind of overlap uh, on the issues. So I guess the title of The Seven Deadly Sins began with him. and. I've kind of expanded it. And I would say that the first deadly sin is, as a board, know what authority you have under your governing documents. The fact you've been elected to a board does not give you infinite authority to do whatever you want to do. Your authority is vested in your governing documents and the definition of board's authority. Now, let me give you an example of a case I'm, I'm working on right now. And I'll try to keep it simple as these get quite complex at times. Imagine an association that was founded 30 years ago and the association governing documents provide for short-term vacation rentals. Very popular topic today. Yeah. And so then the board gets elected, a new board, as it happens every year, it always kind of shifts. They say, I don't like vacation rentals, short-term vacation rentals. I'm going to amend the governing documents to make it that rentals of not less than 180 days, six months. Mm. Well, the issue becomes, I, I, I kin this to being on a cruise ship. You bought a ticket on your cruise ship to go to Tahiti, and meanwhile, you get on board the ship and you depart. The majority or supermajority of the passengers say, no, I want to go to San Francisco instead. <laughs> Is that really fair to the minority members who bought a ticket to go to Tahiti? Right. When an association is founded under its governing documents with a purpose, it's not easy to make overhaul, wholesale overall changes that affect the rights of minorities or what the original in, intention was because mortgage companies and lenders have loaned money based on that. Right. Owners have bought figuring I have some vacation rental income, and all of a sudden the board is saying, and does that create an issue because they're taking their personal preferences right. and applying it to I want to change the documents when in fact they have a duty to the entire association and a duty to including the minority members in their conduct. So I think the most critical thing I would say to you is that number one, they gotta know what authority they have in their governing documents. And then number two, they have to realize that under that authority, they have an obligation to the association as a whole and an obligation to all of the members, 
including minority members, with regard to the intent of what that association is about. They are not government. Right, right. And so I, I would say the first thing is they've always got to do is have loyalty to all the owners, have loyalty to the association, even though their personal views might be different. And they have to know what authority that's vested in them and be able to um, follow that authority and not interject their own personal views into that, that authority. Right, within the guidelines of their governing documents, there are ways to change the status quo, if you will. Right. But it, you have to adhere, like you said, boards are not the, um, they cannot just change things on their own. They have to, right. yeah. Well, what's interesting in, in that concept, when you think about it, is, is that when you have that, even the right of a supermajority to say, okay, we want to change it, like we see it with smoking in condos. Mm -hmm. You can amend the bylaws, make it mm -hmm. a non smoking building. What typically happens, the board of this duty of loyalty, has to recognize that there are some smokers and or people who do short-term vacation rentals in my example, and look at grandfathering. So they can say, we wanna make this change for the good, maybe they get the super majority, but they can't ignore the original rights under, uh, vested under the original it. governing documents and, and make wholesale changes and say, tough luck, you can't vacation rent anymore and, and, and take punitive action when in fact that was not the original intent of the association in the first place. Right, good point, good point. Uh, would you say that in the majority of these type of cases, it's always advisable when you are in a situation where you have um, differences of, in terms of how the association should be governed, governed, you should always, outside of the governing documents, seek professional advice? Well, that's deadly sin number two. Oh, that's deadly. You, you okay. got, you, you, you're reading my mind, that's deadly <laughs> sin number two. Okay. Just think of it this way. Board members are volunteers. They're not very really skilled for the most part, probably 99% right. in condo management, the laws, the standards of care, the practices. And so if they're gonna make major changes, the business judgment rule would say they should get professional advice. Let's go back to the example I gave you that this particular association wanted to amend this document to do away with short-term vacation rentals, which by then, by their documents were 30 days or more, by the way, not the uh, seven and 14 days we typically think of. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to make it 180 days. Well, they might have thought about getting professional advice on how to do that. Because in this case, this association had seven sub-associations. And so the sub-associations each would elect one director to the master association. And so they went out to the owners of the seven sub-associations they needed 67% to approve the governing documents, and they got 25%. Well, then the board decided, well, you know, in reading our governing documents, they didn't ask the lawyer, I think we can vote for all those people who didn't vote at all, because oh. when they elected you, they really elected you to represent them, so all those people who didn't vote, you can go ahead and vote for them, you seven elected directors, for those people who didn't vote at all. Yeah, deadly sin. <laughs> now, if they'd had professional advice, because their own lawyer ultimately um, uh, said you can't do that, but meanwhile, they went ahead and implemented it anyway and started finding those people who were uh, doing vacation rentals for decades, $10,000 a day, and basically took the position that even their professional was wrong. Now, that was overruled by an arbitration panel, by the way, but you can imagine the destruction it does to the community, yeah. the people, when in fact, if they had said, look, changing the governing documents is a major change to the entity. We should have a discussion, the pros and cons. We should have uh, interest to make sure this is thoroughly vetted by all the owners. So right. the, the true will of the owners is, is achieved, right. and even if the supermajority wanted to put the 180-day rule in effect, they would have to say in loyalty to the people in the history, okay, well, how do we work our way into that and take care of those people who've done this for years, who got mortgages and based their income and their platform in that, because they have some obligation of loyalty to all, not just those people. So another, another deadly thing is not getting professional advice. Maybe professional advice on a contract, 
maybe be on what kind of fix there is to the stairways that were that may be falling down that need an engineering study. But they should realize that they don't necessarily have the skills to do that. They should hire professionals, whether it be lawyers or architects or engineers, to help identify these greater problems and to try to work their way to. through it and save a few bucks and, and create this problem. Right. Right, it's their fiduciary duty to do so, to do all due diligence and make sure they invite the experts in to give them sound advice to protect them. I see oftentimes, particularly in foreclosures, you know, they, they don't want to spend the money, so they read it and interpret the documents themselves as lay people and make a decision and then start taking action, which only subjects the association to litigation and other problems. In this one particular case on the voting, uh, the owners who ultimately did file and got into arbitration were awarded $350,000 in legal fees because the arbitrators thought it was so egregious that the people voted for somebody else that was clear in their documents and subsequently they had, they had legal opinions saying, no, you can't do that. They continued they to fight that anyway. they could do it yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, but it's never a good... Um Never a good ending when you go against sound legal advice. Your advice is what protects you. I think we're all, legal in some way, um, prejudiced by our life experiences, and maybe what we want, what, what we want the outcome to be. And we could you know, read things, you know, one of two ways, you know. But there's a lot of court practice, a lot of court history, a lot of experience Case out there, study. what the yeah. clear meaning of shell and will and all these things mean. and. It really isn't incumbent upon a volunteer board yeah. to be afraid to spend a few bucks with their own counsel or with an architect or engineer or some qualified professional to guide them through these major issues. So at least in number one, know what your authority is. At least in number two is go to professionals to get advice before you make decisions. Great. Deadly sins. Uh, so we're down two. We have five to go, but we're just in time for a break. Uh, so please come back to hear the other five deadly sins uh, and join us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion on the seven deadly sins of a condo board of directors. I think we left off at two, and uh, we'll let you kind of continue going down that path of sharing with us some of the uh, deadly sins. Okay, and the first two probably had the most discussion and explanation, but number three is boards are elected to make a decision. And I go to board meeting after board meeting where they continue to talk about it, defer it, one person mm. objects to it, and they're trying to get unanimity where 100% agree on something, where you know boards are kind of a democratic policy, and you may have a vote of four to three or five to four at some point in time. You can't push the can down the road forever, because I remember an association in Waikiki that um, the board was looking at an issue where they had, it's a four-story walk-up, they had no elevator, there were stairs, uh, the engineer and architect said, your stairs are about to fall down and kill somebody. And the board were looking at, well, how do we fix them? And they talked to people and they needed to borrow some money. It was going to raise maintenance fees, $15 a month. But we don't want to raise $15 a month. Is there anything else oh, we can gee. do? 
and they spent months kicking the can down the road on a clear safety issue. At some point in time, they're elected to make decisions. Make they have decision. to make a decision. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't just kick the can down the road forever, and they can't be under the belief that they can only make a decision if the entire board agrees in unanimity that that's what it's going to take. So I see the biggest problem is oftentimes boards refuse to make a decision. They just keep deferring, deferring, as either the members, the owners, or another board member has some objection to it. But we got to study it some more. And at some mm. point in time, you got to make a decision. Yep. You're never going to satisfy everyone. So make a decision and move on and get these things taken care of in a timely fashion. And number four, which leads into that, mm. is the decision on budgets and increasing maintenance fees and what to do Lovely about reserves. Topic. I don't know what it is. I was just working with one of our staff at the company uh, today, and I, I saw the letter from the board to the owners, and it basically said, good news, we're going to not raise maintenance fees this year, but we're going to reduce our contributions from $5,000 a month to $4,000 a month, because we're just going to adopt last year's reserve study as our reserve study. and. Um, uh, and so good news is we're not raising maintenance fees. So I'm hearing not raising maintenance fees, and did I hear reduction in the reserve, reserve study? Con or well, the reserve contribution, which is never a good practice, and everything around us is going up. So you know, understand this. Board budgets and reserves, particularly the budgets, are based on a zero-sum budget. You figure out the cost, and based on your percentage of common interest, you pay your share. So if the budget's well done, it's going to be pretty accurate. But if it's wrong and you push down the costs, then in fact you don't have enough money to pay your bills or fund the reserves that duty becomes. And when you look at a zero sum budget, if you take the pure truth that water bills are going up, electric bills are going up, you're looking at your manager wants more money, the medical insurance bills for your manager is going up, and then on top of that, insurance, particularly director and officer liability insurance is going up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be inflationary pressure every year. And even though you want to be judicious and responsible in doing a budget and reserve study, to ignore that and say, my job is I've been elected to keep the maintenance fees from going up. I never like the word maintenance fees because they're really an operating fee because yeah. it pays more than maintenance, right? Operational expenses. If you, if you take that position and then you ask yourself, if you reduce the reserve contributions, are you waiting for the surprise five, 10 years from now when you don't have enough money that you're going to kick the can down the road. And I can tell you now, because I'm on two cases now that are on reserve study preparation, where the owners who are getting assessments now are blaming the board for improperly doing their reserve study, saying that, you know, because what happens is if you sold between now and the time that assessment occurs, that owner who sold lucked out. He didn't have to pay for his share as contemplated under the reserve study. So I would just say that boards have to realize that they have a, their number one probably obligation is the financial stability of the association. And nobody wants to raise maintenance fees. But that's probably an unrealistic goal. Yeah. And are they better off acknowledging every year with a one or two or 3% increase based on what the circumstances are? Or are they better off kicking the can down the road? And I used to joke about it until someone else gets elected and has to make the decision <laughs> to raise the maintenance fees 10 or 20%. But the reality of it is, you've been elected to create financial stability. You've been elected to make sure you have enough money in reserves to pay for these things or have the best chance to pay for them. Uh, and you can't take the mindset of your job has been not to raise maintenance fees. Yeah. Nobody wants increased costs, but if you go to the supermarket, you have increased costs. If you go to the fuel pump, you got increased costs. It'd be the same in your condo association. Yeah. That is definitely, in my mind, one of the biggest of the. Um sins, if you will. And so often we see some board members, they get on the board just to keep the maintenance fees low. And then, like you said, they're kicking the can down the road, and then yeah. down the line, it becomes more problematic and costly. Yeah, now leads into deadly sin number five, which is a part of the budget, which is maintain the property. Mm -hmm. You know, your primary role under the government documents is to maintain the property. And so if you have a roof leak, you have to fix the roof leak. If you have a problem in the building is starting to wear out in the painting, because all these deferrals potentially could raise the cost in the future to maintain them 
You might have dry rot, spalling. Yeah. You might have uh, increased cost because your road paving is worse now because the water's gotten into the uh, sub layer of the of the paving. So your job is to maintain the property, not only from a point of view of safety, but from maintain the property as a quality property because remember lenders loan money to people to buy there based on the fact they're believing it's being maintained. So you have some obligation of deadly sin to uh, look at these things that need to be done and not kick the can down the road, but build it into the budget and actually properly take care of the property when it comes to. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I've seen instances where the can was kicked down the road until there was a problem in the, to use the example you just said a moment ago regarding painting, and painting can lead to spalling issues. I can recall an instance where a spalling is, um, issue became a safety issue and someone was injured due to falling, due to falling. Yep. Yeah, this was in my case. It creates problems for your property values, but that leads into the deadly sin number six. I know we have limited time. <laughs> Is that, this all falls apart if you fail to communicate regularly to your yeah. owners. Yeah, I And agree. in some cases, your tenants. You know, it's very important for the board to have open, transparent board meetings, look at where necessary, either e-blasts or newsletters, and telling owners up front what they're dealing with. They may not even have an answer. They can say we're dealing with the spalling in building number two, and we're looking at hiring a contractor. They can say we have issues with parking violations by the fire zone. Their failure to include the owners, so you get this kind of splash effect, trust. a problem yeah. all of a sudden yeah. hits, and there's water in the face on the owners, like what happened? You know, and they start How blaming. Yeah. Where if in fact, if they communicated along the line, to the owners and keep them informed, and at the same time, take all the owners and treat them all with respect, so that even though there may be varied opinions, that they're treated as a part of the membership of the association, they will be a lot better off, and they've got to be always vigilant not to be sidetracked from their duties by a few vocal owners who maybe are against everything. Yeah, and we certainly have those, but I find you're, Transparency is the best practice. And probably for their own protection, if they keep accurate records in the minutes of their decisions, they've protected themselves against liability. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the number of seven deadly sin, I know you were going to ask about that, weren't you? <laughs> I was. What is the seventh deadly sin? And, you know, we see this every year in the legislature, all this crazy legislation where all these accusations about boards are made that they have a conflict of interest in the decisions they make. Most people think of a conflict of interest as they have some financial gain out of something. Like I'm doing the roofing contract and they gave it to me and I'm on the board because I'm going to make more money and I'm kicking back something. Well, you know, you have an obligation not to vote by law on anything you have a conflict of interest and to disclose it. Right. Well, I think people don't understand about conflict of interest is not only the conflict of interest, but the perception of a conflict of interest is equally dangerous if that's what your membership thinks about how the board is operating. But they overlook the conflict of interest, going back to my first example, if you really don't like vacation rentals, and you don't like it because of the way you live your personal lifestyle, is it a conflict of interest to change the entire direction of the association out of your personal belief that you don't want vacation rentals in your association? when it's a personal belief, contrary to the governing documents, contract, in this case, contrary to 30 years of practice of the association, because all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you don't like um, vacation rentals. That's a personal issue. You right. don't like vacation rentals. When going back this. to your obligations of loyalty is to the association as a whole, which includes the foundationing of the governing document, and it's also, to the loyalty of the owners, all the owners, including maybe those owners who have a different opinion than you have. Now, it's not saying they can't amend the governing documents. If they do so by stuffing the ballot box, they do so by preventing mm. wrong information to the owners what the issues are, and not have an open and honest dialogue as all the members should have the rights to hear transparent and hear what the issues truly are and what the risk, pros, rewards, recons are. That's the seventh deadly sin of not knowing your, what what is truly a conflict of interest, allowing personal agendas 
to interfere with your loyalty due to the association and all of the members of the association. And those, from Richard's point of view, are the seven deadly sins. <laughs> well said, well said. And I couldn't agree more with all seven. Uh, we've had experience. I, I get the impression, or I know, being the expert, that you've had experience in every scenario of the seven deadly sins. That's why you can speak so passionately about them. I'm trying to decide whether I should write a book or start a uh, reality TV show. <laughs> Because I don't think people would believe the things we see of misguided boards. I'm not saying yeah. they're bad people with, they just don't follow the business judgment rule and get experts, look at their obligations, look at this as a fundamental obligation to the association and its members, and they start to engage in what they think is the best for the association, don't raise the fee, try, yeah. to, try to reduce the reserves, in yeah. the end, it only hurts the association as a whole. Yeah. Well, hopefully those are the exceptions and not the rule. I think that's important to note. There are a lot of good associations yeah. out there. It's not generally the rule. I think our legislature hears the horror stories and doesn't oh, yeah. realize that there's a very small percentage that really go over the, over the top in some of this stuff. Right. They speak the loudest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. Well, I, I'm sure we can uh, speak on this all day, <laughs> or at least uh, you, you can come up with seven more, but I think, you know, these are the, the top seven, and you, being the industry expert, are attending to these things on a regular basis, so they haven't gone away, but hopefully as we educate boards and associations more, they'll at least reduce, and we won't keep you so busy. I'm hoping that I can write my book and everybody out there will buy my book. And, uh, I know I will buy your book. You know. Yeah, but I agree. I, you know, you can't write this stuff. And uh, being a property manager myself um, for a number of years, you know, I have stories as well. We all do. But, you know, to, to your point, they're generally the exception and not the rule. But those tend to be the ones that speak the loudest. Yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So... Good stuff. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. I always enjoy chit-chatting with my uh, favorite expert and mentor. Don't forget that. Um, and uh, we'll see more of him in the future, hopefully. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. Please come back and join us every week. Thank you. Thank you.